All right, uh, we have uh, top of the hour, 12, no 12 noon here in uh, Durango, Colorado, and we are uh, going to get started. Uh, the folks, I, I want to welcome uh, everyone uh, to our discussion on uh, uh, hybrid learning that works, how to uh, shift to a hybrid learning system. Uh, I'm joined by uh, uh, today's panelists, who I'll be introducing in a moment, uh, and I'm going to be putting a lot of questions to them. Uh, much of today's uh, webinar format is going to be in discussion. Uh, discussion. Uh, after I put questions to the panelists, as I mentioned, I'm uh, going to be encouraging, continuing to encourage all of the attendees uh, to uh, use the chat function uh, to comment. Uh, Please, uh, given that we have a smaller group, I'd like to stick to the chat function uh, as opposed to using the q and I don't think we have such a large group that we uh, are not able to just stick to one area. Uh, I see Terrence's comment from, uh, good morning from Los Angeles. Good morning, Terrence. Thanks for, uh, thanks for being the first uh, uh, attendee to, to use the chat window. I'd love to hear from folks uh, what uh, school or district or other organization you're from. Uh, that would, will certainly help us uh, think about how to uh, make sure we are hitting your questions and uh, concerns. Before we get into the questions, I, I want to take just a couple of minutes to set a foundation about what we're talking about when, when we talk about hybrid learning. I see, uh, oh, okay, this is fantastic. We got somebody from Mexico, uh, as well as uh, Larchmont Charter High in Los Angeles, Michigan. Uh, good to know that we have folks from, from uh, well, already a variety of places. So what are we talking about when we, when we talk about hybrid learning? Well, uh, I, I'm with a company called the Evergreen Education Group. We run the Digital Learning Collaborative uh, and uh, uh, the Digital Learning Annual Conference. We and our colleagues, friends, clients, et cetera, have been thinking about online blended and hybrid learning uh, for a long time, more than 20 years, in fact, as you think about the roots of K-12 online learning back to the early days of the World Wide Web. So for us, and I suspect for many of you, it's been a bit of a whirlwind in the last few months as an area that we and many of you have focused on for so long has become a major focus of every school and district in the country, essentially, as they've switched to remote learning. Still, some of you might be thinking, this isn't really all that new, right? I've been thinking about technology and education uh, maybe my entire career, we use Chromebooks. But at the same time, I think there's a real major distinction between education technology, which has been used in physical schools and classroom settings uh, for a very long time, like depending on how you define education technology, at least 100 years. Um, there's a long line of the next big thing in technology has always been around the corner. At one point, it was radio. Another point, it was TV. Another point, it was desktop computers, CD-ROMs. Lately, it's been artificial intelligence, uh, virtual reality, gaming, and other things that you hear about quite often. But I do think that there's a difference between online learning and its subset hybrid learning. Uh, and, it, and it's really different because of the promise of transforming technology through reducing and or eliminating barriers of time and space while changing the role and, and really highlighting the role of teachers and relationships between teachers and students and between students. And there's some really important aspects of that that we're going to be touching on uh, very soon. Before I do that, I, I, I want to talk about all these issues and, and go to, to um, the next slide. We've been thinking a lot about these issues over the last months as we've been watching school closures, uh, the switch to remote learning, and more recently, uh, schools starting to plan for fall 2021 and beyond. We developed uh, this graphic at, in the very early stages of uh, the pandemic, March 2020. And, and we were predicting, okay, what was this going to look like? We recognized at the time that we were in a phase of a rapid trend, transition to remote learning and teaching. Uh, we expected, uh, and we were starting to see at that point, that after that very quick shift that happened, um, there was a second phase from uh, April to July or so where schools recognized they had gaps in access and equity 
and the need to reach uh, all students, as, including special populations of students. As we went into phase three, we were predicting more or less accurately that schools were likely to have to work with rolling closures as different uh, COVID spikes would continue to happen throughout the fall. There's no question that that has happened, uh, really uh, quite a bit more even than, uh, than we had anticipated. And, and certainly right now, uh, we're in this latest uh, pandemic surge and you're all hearing these stories about school closures uh, that have uh, uh, been picking up recently. At the same time, as we look at phase four, where we, from where we are right now, so we know we're in this really, really difficult time. And I imagine many of you are, are really just dealing day to day with issues of how to address the needs of your students and teachers and staff at this incredibly difficult time. At the same time, we're starting to see there's a light at the end of the tunnel. The vaccines are coming. There's promise of some return to normalcy in the spring semester, and maybe the second half of the spring semester, but we're expecting that uh, to happen at some level. Um, and we're starting to think about what does phase four look like? And part of what phase four may look like is, and is un unknown, but increased levels of online and hybrid learning adoption as a new normal as we look to fall 2021 and beyond. And we do think that hybrid is going to be a key part of that future. What do we mean by hybrid? Well, let's go to the next slide and, and talk about this. At its simplest, when we're talking about hybrid, we're talking about a combination of online and face-to-face -face learning. Uh, at, at almost any level. Anything that's not 100% on-site or 100% online can be labeled hybrid. But in fact, as you look at a hybrid school more closely, and both Kelly and Dan's schools are in this category, what you see are, is that hybrid learning builds on five different layers as shown in this slide. I want to take a minute to talk about these slides to just set up some of the commonalities around hybrid and then uh, our panelists are going to be talking about some of the distinctions and how you think about some of these issues. I want to start with the way hybrid schools use time. Hybrid schools typically have students at a physical school for only a fraction of the time in a typical school week. Um, they may have students coming in for two days a week. Uh, maybe in California where Kelly School is, the requirement is only a student to show up for one hour a week, but oftentimes students are on site for much more time than that. And, and that's fairly common. Secondly, we know that in these schools, when students aren't on site, they have the opportunity uh, to learn online, to, to be taking their courses. But at the same time, they also may be, be pursuing interests such as sports or dancing or ornithology. Older students may be engaged in internships or jobs or taking college classes. Even when students are on site, the school's use of the physical space is quite different than in a mainstream school. There are fewer large group lectures, more individual one-on-one -on -one time between teachers uh, and students and small group instruction as well. And again, our panel is gonna speak to this idea. But this instruction, which ideally is moving seamlessly between online and face-to-face, -face, is supported by digital content embedded within a technology platform. This is a critical component of the hybrid approach. It's not just real-time video. It's got to be a, a system that combines the on-site and online elements, allowing a mix of instructional strategies that are both on-site and online that are a mix of real-time and synchronous. The last thing I want to touch on before talking about our panelists is that we have seen hybrid schools that encourage really, really strong relationships between teachers and staff and students. We see this very, very consistently at hybrid schools. As some of the basic content delivery is shifted to digital content and that platform delivers data to the teachers and school leaders, teachers and staff can really focus on developing deep relationships with students that not only include academics, but outside interests, college and career paths and other pursuits. Okay, I don't wanna give much, any more of a background on that. Instead, I wanna shift over, uh, introduce our panelists and uh, start to put some questions to them. I see we've 
uh, had some other folks weigh in on the chat window. Uh, and uh, we're going to be getting to other questions as they come in. I want to introduce our folks. Um, Yovani Metcalf is v VP of Education and Innovation with Strong Mind, which is a company that's based in Arizona, focusing on helping schools and districts make the transition to, to hybrid. Uh, one of the key elements of Strong Mind's work and commitment to this space is, and this is really a key element, they were implementing hybrid strategies before COVID hit. So you hear all about hybrid now, pretty much every day in the media, but Strong Mind was thinking about hybrid and using that terminology far before anybody had ever heard of COVID or the coronavirus. Um, Yuvani was previously at the Arizona Department of Education, which is how I had originally met her. Dan Milan is principal of a hybrid school in Arizona um, that he just joined this school year. Prior to that, he was running the online and hybrid programs at the Ephrata School District in Pennsylvania. And uh, I knew Dan from his days back in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, Kelly Schwartzke is an instructor at Oasis High School in Santa Cruz, California. Uh, she is integrally involved with the design and delivery of all aspects uh, of uh, her school and of other schools that is uh, that are operated by the County Office of Education. Uh, she was also previously at the County Office helping districts launch, grow, and improve their online and hybrid schools. Um, and finally, uh, Angelica Vega Foley is StrongMind's VP of Partner Success. Um, as we talk about hybrid approaches to teaching and learning, we're going to get into depth about how people are more important than technology. And I'm sure you've all heard that. Uh, in this case, Angelica, in part of this presentation, is going to talk about that as she really serves as a key link between StrongMind's partner schools and how they use a variety of digital content, the technology platform, and other products. Um, before we do that, we do want to launch a couple of poll questions to get a better sense for where all our uh, attendees are in thinking about some of these issues. Uh, so Kels is putting up uh, a quick poll of two questions. Is your school or district currently employing a hybrid learning model? And uh, if so, um, what kind of support are you seeking from among those options? And Kels, I think you launched that poll. So uh, I'm going to uh, let uh, you, if you can comment on how you're seeing the questions uh, or the answers come in, I should say. And uh, uh, if they're coming in quickly enough, we may just take a moment here and look at those answers and comment on them. If they're coming in a bit more slowly, uh, I may start with uh, going to our first questions. Uh, it looks like we have quite a few answers coming in already. So lots of schools have started some hybrid learning. Lots of schools haven't. Um, some are still in development. So it's, it, there's we've got quite a great mixture in here. And then as far as question number two, I'm seeing a lot of um, answers for social emotional learning, uh, which is wonderful. And scheduling assistance is the other top answer for the type of support. All right, not uh, not a surprise uh, between either of those. Uh, Kels, I'm not sure if you're planning to post those results or not. E either is uh, fine with me, but uh, we're going to move on and, and start asking some questions of the panelists. I'm going to be going to Yuvani momentarily. I uh, do want to remind folks that as you uh, are listening, we are watching the chat window, so please uh, continue to put those questions there. Um, and, oh, and Kels, thanks for uh, sharing the poll results. Uh, interesting that, uh, well, it's not actually, it's not too much of a surprise that we've got 45% uh, of uh, uh, participants already employing the hybrid learning model. Uh, that leaves uh, the 55% somewhere in development or not or thinking about it. And then uh, also interesting to see SEL. Uh, as the number one uh, support being listed. Uh, not, also not a surprise around scheduling assistance as well. Uh, all right, very, very useful. Yovani, I wanna go to you. Uh, I mentioned that StrongLine has been thinking about hybrid for a while. Curious if you could give us an overview of how that all came about. Thank you, John. Um, StrongMind has been in the digital learning space for two decades. 
registering students in grades six through 12. And when we, um, and over that time period, we realized that fully virtual learning is, um, is a solution and it's an important one in the, in the landscape, in the educational landscape. However, it's not going to be um, the solution for everyone. And it's going to be right for a subset of students. So we knew that digital learning, that technology was going to be an important, was going to play an important role in um, reaching more students and reaching more students effectively. So we sought out to better understand and learn from all of the different variations of blended and hybrid schools around the country, um, trying to get a much better understanding for how teachers in classrooms were navigating between uh, educational technology and their relationships with students and what their role was going to be in the classroom. And so in that time frame, we realized a few things. We realized that time and place and even digital curriculum played important roles to help facilitate that teacher and student interaction that was going to better um, support learning, teaching and learning. Um, and in that time frame, we toured many schools and one of them was Kelly, Kelly School in California. Uh, Kelly has a wonderful program and she was kind enough to host us and teach us all about um, what she was doing with her population of students. Kelly, your bunny is uh, teed, teed you up to talk about uh, Oasis. Uh, can you give us a, a, a bit of background? Why did the county office uh, start the school? What's that journey been like? Uh, Kelly, you are on mute. Your dream come true, John. So in California, the Department of Education requires that county offices have an alternative learning program. So that has changed in definition uh, since I have been in education. I think I started teaching in 1993. So the change in, in alternative ed in Santa Cruz and in the four counties that I work with has been uh, the idea of small school models and independent study, uh, which obviously lends itself to online and hybrid learning. OASIS in particular is built on an independent study model, but is leaning more towards hybrid and uh, expanding towards a hybrid model because we are realizing that the most effective way to teach math, uh, particularly virtually, is in small classes. So we're looking at changing the model for fall, as it turns out, uh, first because we had to, and now because we're realizing, as we look around at some of the successes, we're talking about what do we wanna keep as we move forward? And uh, some of the barriers we thought were there for independent study or our small site schools, uh, those barriers may not be what we thought they were. So there is this opportunity to relook at what we're delivering. In independent study, uh, like you mentioned, there's a huge focus on relationships. So before this um, webinar, I met with one of my students for an hour who's dual enrolled at the local community college where we are housed. And he has an internship uh, with a video production company. And he and I work on an education plan that's personalized for him. The student that I meet with after this webinar is not ticking any of those boxes. So the idea is that we meet together as a family and, a, and as the teacher and decide which of the things you see on the list on the screen, the student wants to take advantage of or are a best fit for what they're trying to accomplish, what, which might be a high school diploma. It might be navigating um, medically fragile status. It might be that they're behind in credits. It might be that they want to accelerate. Uh, we're seeing increasingly the number of students that want to take advantage of the free dual enrollment at the community college. And just historically, when I started at uh, Oasis in, 19, let's see, 2009, there was about 120 students there, and today we're over 260. So the growth is really not in students who are behind in credits, which is, might be the perception. The growth is in students that want um, personalized learning, and increasingly that includes hybrid to some extent. The, uh, you know, as you were talking, I was thinking about this is truly personalized learning. When you, when you talk about spending an hour with a student and working through what that student is uh, trying to do and, 
and their goals and, and then going on to the next student, they've got a completely different set of goals. And, and to me, what we see in uh, so many hybrid schools is a level of attention that somebody like you is able to give to, to all students in that way. And we've done a lot of interviews and focus groups with students in hybrid schools as well that, that consistently talk about that um, also. Uh, Dan Milan, uh, you're in a somewhat similar, in, in some ways, uh, hybrid school in, uh, in Arizona. Uh, can you tell us about Valor? Sure. I, I think um, leading the Valor might, might help a little bit. My, my background is, as you said, Pennsylvania. We're in public ed, and it was born of a, a competition model. There were a lot of cyber charters in um, MPA. So in 2008, we realized we needed to get in that game. So it was my responsibility to uh, create some models that help make learning more flexible and kind of meet the need of obviously there was a there was a strong need for students not to be kind of just locked in to uh, straight seven hours with you know individual classes so we began at that point uh, I began running an online school which is strictly online um, and then uh, we also opened up our school so the students could come into one at a time which would be a version of blended and and then we opened an online lab school which is open from 8 a.m to 8 30 at night in four hours which is a bit of more of a more of an alternative ed feel but uh more of uh you know uh, definitely for kids who are struggling uh some of what kels was describing students who are more fragile we had to uh, adjust to home life situations um, and make things more flexible for them and then uh some of the fun work began of once we had cracked that uh that model a little bit it was getting hybrid learning into the public schools and that was certainly more of a challenge. And that's where I got into this um, a passion for leveraging what teachers do really well, which it brought me to Valor. One of the, one of the biggest struggles we found in, in public ed that I found in public ed was convincing people was the right idea. Our targets uh, were now better that we wanted to empower parents, empower students, empower teachers. Um, but kind of switching that model of what does that look like when you have to change all those pieces at one time. So what we would do is we would take um, around six teachers at a time and run them through so you can only see your kids three days a week. What is the most value that you have as a teacher when if, you, if you're gonna offload the work to online, what is to online, meaning anything you can Google, don't bother teaching that straight up, um, offer that some other way. And then, but what do you add? What's your relationship you're building with the students? And um, what are the things you need to enhance or remediate? And so that's what led us there. But the real challenge for us was that we were building online learning at the same time as we were trying to increase pedagogy. You know, it was just, it was just too much of a lift. So one of the things that really drew me to Valor out here is it's already in place. Uh, we're using uh, the strong mind curriculum um, that Giovanni was describing. And um, so that kind of sets the foundation for what we do. And so our, our um, instructional model has got uh, six pieces to it. Three of those pieces we leave to online, which is flexibility, uh, content delivery as a foundation, and uh, the flexibility pieces of it. What we leave to our teachers is what we have to do is we have to build our four C's up. We have to make sure our, t our students are collaborating, critically thinking, being creative and communicating their ideas and we have to make sure they're using those dispositions, those you know, uh, risk taking and all those things that you really need to be able to apply knowledge that you've got from the core content. Uh, we have to make sure it's transparent and we have to make sure that it empowers people, like you said, as you, as you can see on the slide, that they're growth minded, they're resilient. And um, you know, that's, that's the model we run here. So those are the pieces that teachers have to do. The real value of teachers is imparting those pieces as Kelly was describing getting to know your kids and um, getting used to them. So our system here looks like the students have to be here from eight to 12. As, as you described, John, we don't, um, time, is, time is not our variable. It's, it's well, it's a variable, it's not the constant. We have them here from eight to 12. Our teachers get to see students twice a week for about an hour and a half each of those times. Um, and they have to really make that decision. What is the power of of our relationship together. What am I enhancing? What am I remediating? How are we reading the data that comes in from StrongMind to, to build um, a better, more personalized learning for our kids? And then that leads to more project-based learning, uh, more of that design thinking. So we use the hybrid 
uh, model to um, enhance in the morning. And then afternoon, they meet with the students one on one um, and as, as needed. So if a student is really flying along, that kind of support is more like how do we enhance the learning? But if they're struggling, they can meet in the afternoon one on one with a content specialist. Um, and Friday's open entirely for them to meet with, uh, with our teachers just kind of to help fix some of the issues or to build some of the learning that we're looking for. Dan, I, uh, I appreciate you getting into some of the, the uh, scheduling details of how uh, Valor works. I may come back to uh, Kelly to hear a little bit more about how that approach, how the scheduling works at, at Oasis. I, I do want to mention that in our, uh, and by the way, and Helica, I haven't forgotten that I haven't gotten to you yet <laughs> to, to do your intro. Uh, I, I will get there momentarily, but uh, sometimes we get this question of, okay, what's, what's the right hybrid schedule model? What's the best hybrid schedule model? I can tell you we've looked at dozens of hybrid schools and they all vary. And not only do they all vary, but in a lot of cases, what they tell us is the teacher decides. Or in a lot of cases, there's one, one teacher who's playing a mentor or facilitator or champion role for each student. And they'll say that that's the person who decides is this student is, is this student okay with coming in once a week for an hour or is that a student who's really going to benefit from being in three or four maybe even uh, five days a week so we do see a lot of different models and uh, and a lot of flexibility uh, be, that, that's given to uh, teachers and others who are working with students um, and Helica I want to go back to you or to you uh, you've spent a lot of uh, a lot of time uh, as a teacher and working with teachers and school leaders throughout your career. Um, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about what you've seen in hybrid schools that helps teachers better reach their students. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you, John. Um, I would say, again, to, to kind of echo what other folks have already said, the primary thing that I've seen that's continued to work really well is we just don't forget what we already know about strong teaching and learning, that we continue to use those foundations and we infuse them. But at the same time, we also kind of expand our perspective and our mindset as far as what is possible. Um, so obviously, as, as Giovanni had mentioned, StrongMind had already started to think about hybrid learning and courses long before COVID was on the scene. Um, and as we are talking to a lot of schools around the country right now, we want to ensure that folks are not just reacting to what's happening in COVID, but rather meaningfully responding to just adapt to like what's happening presently, but then also where the future of education is going. And so when I think about when I'm working with teachers and school leaders, we're just ensuring that as we are making shifts and in these incremental moves towards a a model that works better for our students or for our school community. We're not we're not completely letting go of the things that we already knew that were in place that were working really well. And um, one of the big, one of the things behind the um, development that is included when we when we think about using a digital curriculum is to ensure that we're still continuing to use those feedback loops, right? So that we're still having our teachers gather together and they are planning, they're teaching, they're analyzing, and then they're they're adapting, and that that cycle is going along the way. And throughout that time, they're also sharing best practices with one another, with one another, or sharing best practices with other schools. Um, but essentially, they're not rejecting or letting go of what those. Um, core principles of really great teaching and learning are, but just then expanding, what does this look like? And, and so when we think about what uh, Dan had also mentioned, um, I think some of the two of the biggest things there are just first in, in being flexible with yourself and with your, your students, um, but then also thinking in how else can this, or what rather what content can be delivered and then how should uh, my teachers, how should we be spending our time um, when we are with our students? Um, I think the other thing that I would add there is, is the most incredible thing that I've seen at the hybrid schools is the students willingness and readiness to learn in a new and different way. I would say majority of our students at this time are um, native to technology. They don't know a world without it. Uh, and so they are, they're ready to go. And I think it's just really teachers and school leaders and, and systems being ready to support them to go there with you're bringing up some uh, great points on how they got the, there was a question that came in a, a little bit earlier about uh, hybrid, uh, what one, uh, one of our uh, attendees talked about hybrid as, as teachers instructing synchronously uh, while some students are in front of them and some students are at home. We work with a lot of mainstream districts and, and we recognize that that type of approach, first of all, is very common. And second of all, in a 
COVID response remote learning kind of situation, which we're all in, it can make sense to be doing that. Having said that, the answers that have come out from all of you really reflect the idea that a hybrid school is really built on a lot of asynchronous instruction as well as synchronous. Uh, and, and it really is uh, a fairly different approach or perhaps in fact, a very different approach than having your teachers simultaneously instruct students who are in front of them and also learning from home. I, I don't know if any of you wanna weigh in on that uh, a bit further. Well, John, I can, I can move there. I can honestly say we, we do both. We run asynchronous and uh, synchronous classes. Rather, excuse me. We run synchronous classes online as well as face-to-face -face, uh, in our morning session. I mean, if I had my druthers, we would not do it that way. Um, but the constraints um, lead us of, of COVID, meaning I, if I had my choice, I would have my kids on site for a structured period of time and not online, but this is, this is where we're at. What I've found is, um, as we got into it, we, um, the focus has to be on your learner production behaviors and just making sure that you know why you're doing the work. It's not so much to say, okay, how do I take this lesson and make it an online activity? The question is, what are you expecting your students to produce and why? Like, what, what are they gaining from the process? And if, if it's just because it works well online, we probably ought to scrap it. Um, and you can make almost anything adapt as long as you know why they're doing it. Uh, what we run into trouble with is if a teacher, for example, said, I have this great activity, works great on site, but it doesn't work well online. And then we have to go back and say, okay, well, why did you want to do it? How does that link up to what they've done with their, with our strong mind online curriculum? And what is the function of, of doing it? And is there another way for your student to show you what they learned besides exactly what you've laid out in the first place? So just consider the learner production behaviors as the, as the, as the focus of it. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I, wanted, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, thinking about what's happening now versus planning for the uh, fall and beyond. But before we do that, uh, I, I wanna go back to the fact that our uh, early polling question identified SEL as a, a critical issue. And uh, I think it's no secret, a lot, of, a lot of students are struggling in a lot of ways. A lot of non-students are struggling in a lot of ways too. Um, uh, Yvonne, you've been thinking about SEL. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that in, in uh, a hybrid setting or however you think about SEL. Um, thanks, John. Uh, what Dan said is key. It's really about how you're using that time and how you're changing, how you're um, changing behaviors, both when students are in front of you and when students are learning independently. Um, and doing uh, more of those activities that are going to cause that self exploration and the um, and the self um, the self advocacy. Uh, those behaviors are absolute are an essential part of being an effective online learner. Whether or not you're in K twelve, whether or not you're an adult student, but those but those behaviors aren't something that come naturally to any of us. In fact, the like in social and emotional learning, social is first because we learn many of these skills through our social interactions. And these social interactions, they do change when, the, when you have a virtual or hybrid environment. So what we did was we um, took that into account and within our hybrid um, curriculum, within our hybrid model uh, that we're using with in schools like dance, we have created um, teachable moments, virtually teachable moments that go through the um, go through a practice exercise. So students are developing those SEL competencies that they can then transfer um, into the classroom, so that teachers can use these uh, activities to start conversations and start dialogues that they wouldn't otherwise have the opportunity to um, to have without this very intentional, very purposeful um, time carved out that was also very relevant to where a student is uh, physically, perhaps not face-to-face -face with the teacher and, where, and what the student is trying to work on or trying to accomplish. So very academically relevant, very personally relevant and very, very um, engaging uh, content for both students and teachers to kind of mimic what we lose 
when we're not when we're not in a traditional classroom struggling with those practices that help us become the people that uh, have self-awareness, social awareness, responsible decision-making, all of those factors that we can lose if we're not purposely uh, cultivating them in our students. And so that's why we developed Strong-Minded, which is our social and emotional learning um, platform. John, you're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> uh, a, a, a deer apparently walked by outside and, and uh, what you would have all been hearing instead of Yovani would have been uh, a cedar dog exploding in anger at the thought that a deer was walking outside. Uh, the, so I, I want to I think about the, where we are in time right now. Uh, here we are, and I mentioned this earlier. So it's December, we, we saw the COVID uh, uh, situation uh, getting a bit calmer in, in, in some months in the fall. A lot of schools were going back to face-to-face. -to -face. Now we're in the, the, third, the third spike, there's no question. Uh, schools, uh, and including across entire states, in some cases are, are now back to um, remote learning. At the same time, we also see folks, e even in the middle of dealing with how are we addressing the next weeks, months, uh, starting to think about what are we putting in place for uh, the longer term? Uh, fall 2021 and beyond. And in fact, uh, I, I mentioned the idea of we see a lot of districts that are that are doing this combination of teachers teaching synchronously both to their students in front of them and students at home. And uh, we get, uh, we have a, uh, and, and we know a lot of these folks are telling us, look, we don't think this is ideal, but we're trying to think about how to improve this, how, how to come up with something that's a bit more sustainable. One of the things that they recognize is that when you're on this kind of schedule, teachers are going all day and they, they're not being given any additional prep time to think about these issues. Um, Yvonne, I want to go back to you and talk about, how do you think about teacher support in, in, the, in a hybrid school? So one of the things that I'm really proud of us for doing is um, really carving out a place in the digital curriculum for a teacher and for teacher-led activities. Because a lot of times, the things that teachers struggle with in a classroom, the lesson planning, the grading, those don't go away in a virtual classroom. Those, and so a lot of what we focused on was how to create space for a teacher to do what teachers do best, reinforce learning, supplement, um, supplement and supplant those activities that require a more authentic assessment of student learning. Um, so for every digital learning activity, there is a teacher-led option with several teacher-led options that are already lesson planned that teachers can curate and go through without having to, without having to start from scratch basically every single lesson, every single day. And so teachers can use these materials in our teacher resource guide to address activities that they may want to do students to do independently in the classroom that they may want students to do in a small group interaction. Um, all of these, all of these supports are built into the digital curriculum so that it's not just an online course that students go through and the teacher certifies the grade at the end. It is an online course that a teacher and a student goes through and there's just as much teacher engagement as there is student engagement. So the, so it really is a, multi-pronged approach at supporting teaching and learning in a in a classroom, whether or not that classroom is in an LMS or whether or not that classroom is in a physical building. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Ivani. We have just we just had a question come in uh, through the Q&A about what, what kind of, uh, and I'm going to put this question to uh, maybe first Kelly and, and, uh, and then Dan, um, what kind of assessment is well, the question is what kind of assessment is adequate for hybrid learning? Uh, Kelly, I'm gonna start with you. How do you think about assessment at Oasis and the other schools you've worked with? That is a very large question. So I think what, what uh, Dan said earlier is an, is an important shift that some of the innovative teachers have been talking about for a long time and now is gaining some traction which is, I think Dan called it uh, learner production behavior by which uh, I hope he means that we're looking at what is the output that we need and then going back to the bigger question, which is 
we've had to change everything. So now's a good time to go back and look at our educational goals rather than just trying to band-aid what we continue doing, but in a new format. So in terms of assessment, we have uh, pre and post tests that were delivered um, online. So that was simple. And the teachers that I'm working with in independent study, but I also support teachers in our classroom sites are really taking a minute to pause and think about what, it, what is the output that we need? What are the traditional assessments? Could we possibly do fewer, but more integrated in a way that allows students to have more discussion and input and more mimic um, total quality management circles from the 80s rather than just constantly, this is the module, this is the assessment, we're moving on to the next module, whether that's face-to-face -face or online. So I think the assessment conversation is um, changing because of the, the delivery options. As those open up, it's really pushing on, let's not just move over our assessments, but let's think very seriously about what are we trying to assess? So it's this kind of cycle that's pushing on instruction. Uh, it's pushing on assessment. It's, it's um, like an independent study. We're supposed to have you know, a, a sample per subject per month. Uh, we've been discussing how to do that virtually. They, the state just decided they want it all in paper. So just yesterday I was having a conversation about, well, are we looking for evidence of learning? Are we looking for assessments and demonstrable growth? Like what, what are we trying to do? Or are we just gonna grab assignments and staple them and, and assign credits and assume that's assessment? So I'm not sure I have an answer for you other than um, I'm gratified that the conversation has been shifting and there's more possibilities entering the conversation um, out of necessity. And I think that we will continue that even as some of our sites shift back to um, traditional learning eventually. I think more of us will stay hybrid and the assessments will be um, changing and shifting. Dan, anything to add? Yeah, well, first of all, I have to give credit to uh, Stephen Barkley. Learner production behavior was borrowed from um, the work he has done. I've read uh, a lot of his work, and I appreciate, um, as you are exactly right, Kelly, it's um, looking at what we want the output to be and then thinking about the behaviors that lead to that output and focusing on both of those. We use the words evidence of learning all the time in, in our environment because that evidence happens in small group, teacher-led. So one of the questions that always comes up is, especially when you have a full, uh, a hybrid learning program, and it is a digital side that's laying our foundation that teachers will ask. And you know, and our teachers here, there's just four of them. We have four teachers of representing the four cores, and uh, so, you know, highly qualified teachers. Um, but they will they will ask, how do we know they're not cheating? You know, how do you know they're not just copying the answers if we're not staring at them? And the answer is, you can't cheat with people face to face when you're talking with them or you ask them to authentically produce something, you can't cheat that moment. And that's why the hybrid model is, is offers so much more than just, uh, just a straight face-to-face because -face. there's a moment, whether you're face-to-face -face online, face-to-face -face in person, you just can't fudge it. It's just, and it doesn't have to be a gotcha moment. It's like, wow, I see these gaps you just offered me. Your evidence of learning is missing these key components and I need you to go back and backfill this or put this back in there. Um, so it's those enhanced conversations you get from focusing on evidence of learning and not just, and, and, you know, certainly leave the foundational pieces there to online, those formative assessments that say, in our, in our case, in the StrongMind curriculum, they have workbooks, and those workbooks allow them to go in and do it more than once, um, so they see what they got wrong and do it again. They have these um, checkpoints, which are deeper, and then, of course, the discussion pieces. We take those discussion pieces out and say, let's do that face-to-face. Let's do some of those other pieces that, that when we get together, that's, our, that's a significant evidence of learning. But we also have those other pieces that are just, you know, certainly more practice this skill over and over again. And we see what you struggle with. We see that you got it wrong the first time. You got it wrong the, right the second time. And that way we can say, okay, you struggled the first time. How did you get through that? And that informs our instruction when we get face-to-face -face with the kids. John, can I just add something onto Dan? I think a shorter answer earlier would have been that one of the major demonstrable shifts in assessment is instead of saying this is the US history textbook, it's aligned to the standards, we're breaking it up over 18 weeks, you're doing a chapter and you're answering these questions even though they're aligned to Bloom's taxonomy, 
we're looking at what is the essential question that we need the student to be able to answer through reading, writing, speaking, and listening through the English standards. We're starting the unit with that essential question. We're linking those essential questions to the prior essential question. We're prepping them for where they're going so that whether they were asked to give a speech, engage in a conversation, participate in a discussion board, they have the, the essence of what that material is. I, it used to kind of be like thematic learning, except now it's really the, the critical thinking. And then the question that we are able to ask students is, how do you wanna demonstrate that you've mastered this content, whatever it is? Um, and sometimes it can be prescribed and sometimes the students come up with them, but there is more of a discussion with students about assessment unless here's your test without any context. Uh, as, you're, as you're talking, both, both of you, two, two things come to mind. Uh, one thing that comes to mind is I, I'm reminded of a, a visit that I, that I did to a hybrid school here in Colorado called uh, Poudre Global Academy. Uh, and that's a K-12 uh, hybrid school. Uh, very, very uh, successful based on how the state ranks schools. Uh, in a, and it's a mainstream district school, it's not a charter school. Uh, one of the things that the, the, the teachers talked about how they're changing their approaches in ways that both Dan and, and Kelly, you both are talking about. The other thing that really came out uh, to me in, in, that, in that conversation is they kept talking about, we have so much more time to work with each other as professionals. But what, one teacher mentioned to me that she, she's, she was a third grade math teacher. This was early in the school year. And she said, I've got a student and, and it's clear he's got, I, I don't quite understand what's going on. He's got some gaps coming in here, but there's also some other things going on. And she said, in my, in my old school, it would have been fairly difficult for me to find the time and the free time to go connect with his previous math teachers. Here, every Friday is professional learning day for teachers. And so we've got that time and we just did a quick group huddle and talked about that student for a half hour and all of a sudden I had a far greater understanding. The, and what she said is, look, we always try to do this stuff in the school that I came from, but now in the hybrid school that I'm in, this type of approach is just really front and center. But that also raises the question, and, and I'm gonna go to Angelica with this. This is a shift for a lot of teachers, right? How, how do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely. I just appreciate everything you shared, John. And as we've all experienced, in a really necessary way, so much of this conversation has focused on uh, learners and learner outcomes, which is important and I think is a really good grounding place to begin. But it also really needs to shift and pretty rapidly to also start understanding how are we equipping our educators to be best equipped to just do this and do it well. And not just with the tools or the curriculum or the, uh, the technology, but also with the ongoing continuous learning and development. Um, so I, I mean, I was, I was a third grade teacher. I can't imagine uh, what this would have been like if, we, if I had been sprung into this. Um, but I, I would hope that if, if and when that time came that what would have been offered to me by my administration and really for anyone out there offering tools and services would be a recognition of like, this is also a, going to be a steep learning curve for me as well. And so when I think back to like, even that first slide, you, one of the first slides you shared, John, where we looked at um, the space, time, content, technology, platform, and relationships, although it was listed, there's no intention for that to be a list of priorities, right? It's not saying one is more important over the other. Instead, what I hope when educators see something like that is they take from it, what do I already know well about, uh, what do I already do very well regarding content? How am I gonna maintain my relationships here? And then how can I adjust the space and time um, and be really flexible to make sure that students are getting what they ultimately need? And so I think that's why, when I, when I think about the model that we employ here at, at StrongMind when we're working with teachers is something that's again, really, really important is that continued cycle of development and learning is we are continuing to go back and saying, here's a, here's a good starting point. Here is what we know based on what we, we already know we do really well, plus what we learned, we're gonna give it a try. And then we're going to continue and adapt throughout that same cycle, the way that we do for our students. And I would say, I just encourage any school leaders and system leaders who are on the call to really continue to, to bring your educators to the forefront of the conversation. Um, and, and just remember that they, they're also themselves learning, um, but they can do some really incredible things as we've seen. Um, and, and with that, for teachers who are on the call, I would say like also giving yourself a, a healthy amount of grace and recognizing that 
uh, it is not as simple as just shifting what you would have done in a classroom into in front of a camera. And it, it, in fact, if it were that easy, I don't think that it would act necessarily have been really great quality, but being able to say like, what do I already know? And what do I do really well? Um, and what, what content do my kids need? And kind of letting go of the ways in which some of that content is delivered to them and making more meaningful use of the time that you have in front of them with, okay, if they can have this content delivered and, and they can get it in this different format, how can we actually spend our time when we're together? What are the conversations? What is it going to look like? And how could this actually push us forward? Thank you, Angelica. Um, all, all great points, thank you. And, and, and really capturing the, uh, just the, the depth. I love the way you frame that at, at the teacher level and at the school and district leader level as well. Um, folks, we have nine minutes left. Uh, I'm gonna do a quick lightning round in a moment. I'll, I'll remind all the attendees that if you've got any final questions, uh, please uh, get them in now. Uh, I, before we do lightning round, I do want to go back, uh, Kelly, to you, because we do have these questions about scheduling. What does a hybrid schedule look like? I touched on that a little bit. Others have as well, and you touched on it also. But can, can you talk a bit more about both starting with the independent study minimal requirement and then the range of what students are doing? And then the other thing I'd love to hear you talk about, because you told me this when we were visiting, just the idea that learning is so fluid for students at Oasis because learning might be at the community college, it might be a face-to-face -face course there, it might be a purely online course, it might be the learning they're getting through a job or internship. So an independent study, I'm just focusing on what you just asked. So an independent study, we have school hours and then teachers have a roster and they schedule the way that they want. This is the first year that we added in math classes uh, because in, in a crisis, it's amazing the barriers that have come down and the willingness of administration to say, try it, try it next week and let's see what happens. Um, the second piece is that we focus less on training teachers to shift to hybrid and are focused more on coaching them. Um, instead of sort of the drive-by training, this is what it takes to teach hybrid, we're realizing that that shift um, it's incredibly important to have consistent coaching uh, because it's more of a struggle for the teachers uh, than for the students. So the scheduling kind of came second, which at most of our sites looks like this is a school day. You as a school propose a schedule. You come forward, administration will look at it. Some start earlier, some go later, some have a homeroom and then students disperse. Sometimes they're in a computer lab, sometimes students leave similar to Dan. Sometimes they're there in the morning and then they leave. Uh, one of the districts next to us is starting a program where students will start at home and then we'll come to school at 12 together. That's a model, I won't speak to that. Um, but the main idea of the scheduling piece is the scheduling has to be in response to what are we trying to accomplish? What is the goal here? And then the schedule kind of comes around how to be flexible. Obviously outside of alternative ed or comprehensive schools are struggling with the state demand for synchronous learning. It's not ideal and they're struggling, but where there is flex, it really has to do with the site and what the student needs are and what they're trying to accomplish. I hope that helped. Uh, it, it helps. It helps a lot, and also you're, you're raising a really interesting point. And with six minutes left, I want to go to lightning round. Uh, make sure we end on time, or even a couple minutes early. But there is this really interesting question of when you're thinking about hybrid scheduling, how, especially if you're if you're starting uh, uh, hybrid for the first time, what students are you reaching? How extensive is that uh, that effort, and what are the implications uh, for scheduling? All right. Uh, I do want to close with this lightning round question um, for our last couple of minutes. Um, and I'll start with uh, Dan, what's the one thing related to the option of using hybrid learning in the, in the coming school year, starting fall 2021? Uh, what would you like to leave us with related to that? I would just say embrace the complexities of learning and understand that in um, the, the key thing for you to do is align your target, your tools and techniques to new targets. The new targets are empowering students and parents because I doubt they're gonna wanna go back to a straight traditional batch teaching model. So embrace the fact that you know, your teachers are probably not gonna be able to build 
quality curriculum and also be able to um, teach within it at the same time. Think about how complex that is and how you can help them overcome those with, you know, keeping your targets up and offering them tools and techniques and good professional development to get there. Thank you, Dan. And Helen, I'll go to you next. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I would just say, when I think about this, this might just be the moment that we need. It might be the perfect disruption to get us to rethink how we are educating, what questions we're asking, what do our students need to teach and what are we preparing them for? So again, I would just reiterate that the majority of our, our students are uh, tech natives and they're ready for this moment. And I suppose they're just kind of waiting for us to get on board with them. So we should just consider how hybrid learning can support our teachers to ensure the best outcomes um, for our students and not just this year, but for many more to come. Thank you, Angelica. Uh, let's see, I'm going to uh, Kelly next. Look for the high impact levers for what the needs are and where you can shift and don't try and approach everything at once. Uh, for instance, we, we looked at math and let's start with math and then we built around this math need that students were having. So I think it's just, it's about prioritizing and not trying to transform an entire industry, but rather transforming pieces at a time um, that are united by that overarching educational goal. And it's interesting to me because you've been talking about in this session about some of the things that Oasis has been doing recently, some of that being framed as response to pandemic, but Oasis has been changing for as long as I've known it, you're constantly uh, tweaking, and I think that's incredibly valuable. Uh, Yvonne, I'm going to give you the last word. Uh, Yvonne, you're on mute. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, oh. I feel really fortunate that we have people like Dan and Kelly who've been willing to inform our research and our support of hybrid schools, but the level of expertise with hybrid learning is the exception and not the rule. Um, it's really important that uh, teachers are given the time and structure to focus on their students rather than focusing on whether or not they have all their hyperlinks and assignments uploaded into their new platform. There's a middle ground where curriculum and technology can be used in and out of the classroom, wherever the classroom takes us over this next school year. Thank you, Yuvani. All right, we are uh, two minutes uh, from uh, uh, our plan closing. I'm more than glad to Give everyone uh, an additional minute. I'll mention our contact information is up on the screen there. Uh, we'll stay on for just a couple of minutes in case there's any final questions uh, coming in that we might just answer via the, uh, the chat. I know one came in late and uh, uh, Denise mentioned uh, uh, you'll be following up. Um, with that, I wanna thank everyone who's taken part and, and for all the questions and I'm gonna thank the uh, panelists as well. I appreciate the discussion. Every time I listen to uh, each of you, I learn something new, so I really appreciate it. So uh, thank you and uh, look forward to the light at the end of the tunnel when we'll all be able to do some school visits again. And with that, thanks very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.